Here's a special important message. Hello, welcome to Season 2, Episode 14 of We Are The Road Crew, the podcast which takes you behind the scenes in the world of music, speaks to some of the people that help to make those gigs. Do you know those gigs that you love, that you have the best ever time going to? Remember them? They were good, weren't they? Well, um, those people, they're the people that we speak to. My name's Stephen Hill. I am your host for the show. And we have a very, very interesting, exciting show coming up for you today with a gentleman by the name of Tom Campbell. I'll tell you all about Tom in a second. Before I do, as ever, as I have been doing every single week on the show since uh, we've started season two, I want to give a big fist bump a socially distanced fist bump to our friends over at Signature Brew, signaturebrew.co.uk. If you're a bit of a fan of the beer, I know I am. I had a lovely time sitting in my brand new garden last week with the heat blazing down on me. It's been a hot one as we record. We were in the middle of a heat wave and I got an ice bucket, smashed a load of my Signature Brew into the ice bucket, picked out one by one, got one of them t-shirt tans, and just had a few beers and it was lovely. So well done to them. That's my shout for why Signature Brewer Great. There are other reasons. Obviously, they've been working with a whole load of bands, melding music and fine beverages together. You can try their award-winning studio lager, which is something you might have seen around bars and venues in the country. Uh, it's been found in iconic recording studios such as the Metropolis and Strong Room in East London, uh, which is also where Signature Brew, the company itself, was conceived. So go over there and have a little look and maybe pick yourself up some nice beers while you're sitting in your, your garden having a socially distanced drunken time. Also, I want to say, you've probably known, I'm talking about my garden and my house. I'm sitting in my living room actually recording this at the moment. Usually we do record at Factory Studios in London. We're doing everything remotely in this season, obviously due to the pandemic, which has been a real bummer. But I just thought, obviously, we hope to get back to Factory Studios for season three because there will be a season three coming. But that's all in the future. This is the pre- present i want to talk about um, our guest today which is tom campbell as i mentioned tom is a multi-award winning lighting and production designer who's been working in the industry for around 15 years he has worked with some absolutely massive massive bands over the years he's worked with the likes of 30 seconds to mars which i'm sure we will talk about if you know me in my personal life you'll know i have a very strong feelings on that band so that would be interesting cross faith who are a band who i've seen with a phenomenal light show over the years so quite interested to talk to him about that band as well he's worked with bullet for my valentine frank carter and the, and the rattlesnakes young blood um obviously young blood is massive at the moment so um very very interested to hear him uh hear him talk about that as well and yeah lighting design is not somebody that we really talk about that much but if you think about it it makes up a huge proportion of what goes on and happens and you remember from uh from going to see bands so tom is helping to push the genre forward and i'm looking forward to speaking to him so here he is this is me chatting to tom campbell all right, Tom, thank you very much for joining us. We very much appreciate that. I also appreciate, just before we started recording, the first thing I said before we started recording, obviously we're on Zoom doing this remotely, you have two massive swords hanging up on the wall next to <laughs> one of your guitars. That yeah. is intriguing straight away. Talk me through them. Well, I mean, I, I thought you would have picked up on the 71 SG more than the swords, but um, yeah, it's, <laughs> so, so, so it's an awards called the Night of Illumination Awards, and they... Um, they're nicknamed the the Oscars of the lighting world, I guess. And uh, mm. I've been fortunate enough to win two now, which is mental. I've been knighted as a knight of illumination twice. I've been shortlisted four times in five years, which is even more mental, I guess. Um, but it's, it's 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 a nice little, especially the first one. I was I was still it was 2015, so I was I was not that far into my career really. I'm still mm. I, I still don't class myself that far into my career even now. But um, it was. A nice pat, pat on the back from the industry as a whole, you know. What I mean, to go, oh, actually, people are looking at what I'm doing here, and I'm not half bad at it, you know. What I mean, so it was kind of, it was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, that's wicked. Do you get it for a specific performance or a specific design? And if so, what what specific design did you get it for? Yeah, so they're both for two specific designs. First one that I won was for an artist called Anna Kelvey, and we did some shows with the London Heritage Orchestra. Mm. And the second one was for an artist called Nick Mulvey. Again, so two relatively quieter acts that I've been working with, but you can yeah. they're, they're, they're acts that allow me to get a little bit more 
creative and a little bit more arty in a way. So the Nick Mulvey one, for example, we were playing with a lot of sacred geometry and the lights kind of followed that. All of his artwork was a lot of this very trippy DMT vibe, a little bit like Tool, um, the the Alex Gray stuff like that. And we kind of went, um, because I know you're a fan. I am um, a big fan. I thought I'd drop the Alex Gray straight away. Um, (laughs) But um, it was a nice pat on the back. So for the first one, I just, it was was the first time I'd ever been shortlisted and that was good enough for me. And it was a a night out in Troxy in London and I was on the Ava Lights table with an Ava Lights of the desk, the lighting console manufacturers I use. So it was, it, I, I just saw it as a nice night out really with some friends and the the boss of Ava Lights, Steve, he um, said, well, don't worry, don't worry about it. Don't focus too much on that. Let's just have a good time. We went to the bar. We had four shots of tequila, um, <laughs> sat down, had some dinner. Then they called my name out and I'd never spoken in, in front of people before. And there was 3000 people in that room and I had to give a little speech and the acceptance sort of thing. And I said something along the lines of, you're giving a sword to someone who's watched far too much Game of Thrones, so you only have yourself to blame, or something like that. And I got a <laughs> laugh, and that put me at ease, and thanked the crew, and I left. <laughs> so nice, yeah. It was well, cool. well done. I mean, we will build up to that point again, I'm sure, throughout this chat. But let's go right back to the very, very start. Obviously, within live music, we always ask our guests at the start of the show their sort of first experiences of live music. Do you remember the first gig that you ever went to? It might not be the first gig I went to, but the first like proper full shebang, full production that really sticks in my mind was Muse at the end of the Ab- Absolution Tour in Exeter. Right. And I think it was either in a sports centre or in an abattoir. I can't remember. It was, it was like this big industrial building on the outskirts of Exeter and it was the end of the Absolution Tour, so they trashed everything. It was the drummer's birthday, so they beat him up. It was It was just one of those gigs that really stood in my mind and it was the first time I'd seen how lighting and production because obviously muse go huge on that sort of stuff and they yeah, of course. It, even even back then they did um and i've actually been fortunate enough now to hang out with ollie who was doing their lights at the time quite a few times and we've been able to pick each other's brains about stuff so that's kind of cool but he's he's definitely one of my biggest in, in, inspirations and the reason why i did it but at the time i was doing theater at school i guess and i, I suddenly realized that and i was playing drums in bands as well so i suddenly realized mm. that the the link between playing drums and doing the the th- technical theatre side of stuff and how they kind of merged together. And then I was instantly, and I was very fortunate to figure it out quite early, but I instantly realised that's what I want to do. And I, I, I mean, I, I went down the theatre route for a long time, doing lots of musical theatre stuff like Cabaret and Blood Brothers, and I worked at the Bristol Hippodrome. But that was a means to an end almost. I learnt my, learnt my trade, learnt how to do stuff, learnt how to do stuff well. And then I ended up working with a, a Led Zeppelin tribute band called Live Zeppelin, and um, suddenly remembered again, oh yeah, this is what I want to be doing. This mm. is what I enjoy. This is why I want to do it. And this is how I want to be creative, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was definitely music. I also went to see, uh, it was Motorhead, supported by In Flames at the Bristol Colson Hall. Oh, nice. And that was just, it was chaos. It was, it was incredible. It, it was, again, it was, it was, and I'd been to see loads of smaller stuff and I was playing in bands myself at the time, and, but the toilet tour, as it were. And this was the first time I'd seen a full production rig, especially Motorhead, the like thousands of park ends and a flying plane and all this sort of stuff. And <laughs> and even in Flames beforehand, they were they had their own show. The LED light thing that they used, were they doing yeah, that around yeah. the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Something great. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um and they were a relatively new band at the time as well. So they, the fact that they were doing a show was cool to me as well. So and I think that's something I've taken through to this day that the support bands need to have a show. I, there's there's and sometimes an unwritten rule as shows get bigger that they just have the front light and they play. Mm. But some people come to see the support band. So even regardless if they have an LD themselves or if it's their tour manager jumping on the lighting desk for their show, I always try and make sure they have something. Even yeah. if we, some, and nine times out of 10, it's probably something more than they should have, you know what I mean? But they should have a show and it's, it's, it's part of the audience's experience, isn't it? So Yeah, of course. I mean, I think, the most recent example I can think of that is Behemoth coming out on, with Slipknot on that arena tour they they did at the start of 2020. When I walked in, I was like, "Have we missed Behemoth? Because that's a full blown arena production thing that that is." And then Behemoth come out and basically did an arena show as a support to Slipknot. It's fucking amazing. So um, yeah, always you know yeah you you want it. I, I and I was like, fair play to Slipknot for sort of giving a band the opportunity as big an opportunity as they could give them to potentially blow them off stage just by the the look i mean they didn't but you know that behemoth show was incredibly impressive i think that's really cool well, i mean it also shows that 
a band like Slipknot have nothing to prove. They they know they're going to smash it, and mm. they're and then and, and so they want everyone to have a good time. There, I, I I'm not going to name names here because I I definitely shouldn't. But I definitely had a chat with a an LD friend of mine. It was it was his band and my band were headlining festival in Switzerland, and we were both in the same hotel and we were having some drinks. And he said, "Well, I pride myself on just giving the support band the." The front truss. I was like, well, only a shit LD limits the support band to the front truss. You know what I mean? What are you scared of? You've got thousands of pounds worth of equipment. Let them have let them have a show. You know what I mean? Especially when it comes to festivals as well. Who are you to limit? It's not your rig to limit. You know what I mean? So Yeah, true. Um, that's an interesting time when you're talking about, I mean, just picking up on those two bands that you said first sort of inspired you, the sort of first memories you had. You've got Motorhead, obviously, were one of the bands who were coming up through the 80s when the idea of the show, Motley Crue, you know, Iron Maiden, Ozzy, those big, big stadium rock headlining bands in the 80s. It was that kind of excessive, huge, loads of lights, all the bells and whistles that, you know, that that brought with it. And I feel like that kind of died off a bit towards or had died off a lot in the 90s, although it started mm-hmm. to come back towards the, the end of the 90s with bands like Ramstein. I remember Limp Biscuit bringing a sort of what was it, a spaceship and a toilet out with on, on, on stage <laughs> and stuff. Like and, and, and Muse were one of the, I think were one of the sort of, one of those first bands who embraced the idea of having a full show again. Um, so you kind of got in to that at a, at a very, very good time in the industry when the idea of a light show and a sort of production was, was sort of coming back into the, the industry again. Yeah. It's fair to say, I think. I think so. Yeah. It's, um, the band have to be center of attention, no matter what you're doing. You can throw thousands of pounds worth of lights up in the air. And if it's the only, in my opinion, lights are the garnish, I guess, Mm. and a garnish to a good band. Even, even if you're doing these big silhouetted looks, which can be really cool and really appropriate, the artist is still the center of the attention. So sometimes, yeah, sometimes you can notice the lights for the wrong reason. If they're inappropriate or if there's too much going on, that's not a good way to notice what we're doing, you know what I mean? But Yeah, I think the enhancement of the band's, the sort of visual aesthetic of a band being enhanced by what is going on around it is you don't want sort of fire bombs and pops and massive strobe lights for every band in the world, do you? You want no, some things do definitely need to be a bit more subtle. I mean, well, I don't know if, do you know the band Eamon Ra, the Belgian kind of post-metal band? Right. No, okay, I think I'd like so, them though. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> They, I saw them and and they a few years ago, and they got into an argument with the the venue because they played the forum and they wanted all the lights turned off on the stage, but also they wanted like the fire exits covered up and they want they yeah. wanted to play in complete pitch black, and that would have been great for the type of music they make, but obviously they weren't allowed to do that, and they felt that like that was a huge kind of. Yeah. slight and insult on the type of yeah. music that they were trying to make so it must be hard to get it right for every band to get to deliver exactly what they want it's, it's finding the balance between the creativity and the health and safety because there's a hell of a lot of health and safety hoops you have to mm. jump through like turning you can't you just can't turn off the fire exits you know what i mean and but that's my role that's 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 my role i have to take the the crazy creative ideas that my artists have and link it with the modern technology, link it with the, all the health and safety regulations that are everywhere nowadays across everything. And let's see what happens after COVID, but there's going to be more. Mm-hmm. Um, like, for example, I was, I was, I've just been working with a guy called Youngblood, who halfway through the tour says, you know, we're having flames at Brixton. I was like, yeah, yeah. Can they be pink? I was like, well, I, I, let's, let's find out. I don't think it's ever been done before, but let's find out. So I called my... Uh, a guy called Dan Briggs who does all my pyro. I was like, "Can these be pink?" He was like, "Well, give me a week." And he, <laughs> he found the he found the uh, he found the chemicals needed to stick it in there and, and and the right pressure to send these jets up out to make them pink. But he had pink flames. If he wants pink flames, he's going to get pink flames. But um, it's just sometimes pulling back that creative to make it work. You know what I mean? But yeah, on that occasion, we could deliberate everything he wanted. <laughs> yeah, let's go back to what you were talking about before, which is working with the the kind of the, the early days of you working with bands. So starting with the Led Zeppelin tribute band, I mean, firstly, that must have just been a, a bit of a laugh. One hundred. Try, trying to yeah, recreate yeah. Led Zeppelin stadium shows in pubs. Well, it was, like it was around. Thing. Yeah, well, it was around the same time as they did those O2 Arena comeback shows, as it were. Oh right. Um, yeah, there okay. was a and there was a review. And bearing in mind, we had some some lights in the trailer that's that's it they, it wasn't even a tour bus it was like a splitter van 
I think, mm. in fact, I think on that tour, it's an old post van converted into like a, a sleeper van sort of thing. But right. um, so it was really, really toilet tour. But we did get a review saying, don't bother spending all that money on seeing the real Led Zeppelin, just come and see live Zeppelin. You know what I mean? So that was kind of cool. <laughs> and it was, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't even the toilet tour. It was pubs and we were set up and there'll be people drinking around you and stuff like that. And you'd have to keep an eye on every single guitar pedal, before, otherwise they get nicked. You know what I mean? So, but yeah. it was easy to learn. For me, it was easier to learn my trade or, or how to adapt my trade with songs that you, everybody knows, you know, everyone knows yeah. a whole lot of love, you know what I mean? And it's, um, so that was, that was, that was good fun. But then from there, and it, again, it was just word of mouth, but from there I ended up working with a band called Rolo Tomasi and a band called Devil Sold His Soul, who I still work with today. And again, it's, it's that, it's that sort of music that thrives from a, from a show. Like you mm. talk about the post-rock vibe and I got a lot of free reign and I, I was able to craft my own style and, um, with bands that trusted me and wanted me to do what I wanted to do. Like yeah. Rolo Tomasi, Eva from Rolo Tomasi called me the Lord of Light, you know what I mean? And all this sort of stuff. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, um, you've picked two bands there who I think, despite neither of them will be household names, they both have really distinct looking. I mean, I, I love both those. I think both those bands are fucking brilliant. And I was, yeah. I was huge into those bands, but they were putting on shows which complemented the way they sound. Nice. Like they really were. So yeah, yeah. if that, if you were responsible for that, well done. Nine times out of 10, I would have been responsible for that. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, and I mean like the, the devil boys came to my wedding, you know what I mean? They're very good friends of mine and from, mm. from the touring side of stuff. And, um, that's, that's one of the nicest things about touring with people is you become very, very close. You, you become almost like, family for want of a better term and yeah it's, it's a nice it's a nice vibe with those two particular bands as well i don't really work with rollo anymore but um i see them around at the festivals and we always say hi and yeah it's always good but it's that style of music again that and and what you said about they might not be household names but in their little circles they are gods and i've, mm. I've worked with a couple of bands like that that might be a little bit uh left left field i guess but to me they are they're my motorhead or they're my muse, you yeah. know what I mean? And I know their music inside out down to the point with some, some of these artists, I can, we, I jump on the drum kit at sound check or something like that. We can, we can have a little jam and stuff like this. And cause the lights have to be, as I said, they have to be appropriate, but they have to be another layer of the band. You know what I mean? So yeah, uh, if, if you want to be good at your job, in my opinion, you have to know the music as well as, the artists on stage do um, down to the time signatures down to not necessarily down to things like the key and stuff like that, but definitely the time signatures and of the structure. And that goes across everything. Like when I get a new artist now, I will surround myself with their back catalog. Like sometimes if they're a new artist, there's not a lot to learn and you can kind of sit down with the artist and try and figure out which direction they're trying to go with this. Or it's sometimes it's very, very obvious, but uh, I, can, I, I recently started working with a bank called 36 to Mars and they have a huge back catalog. And for the first two weeks of, of the design process, I just sat there listening wherever I went, whenever, whenever I was driving or if I was at the gym or um, just wherever I was, I would just be listening to their sort of music and they, they wouldn't have been something I would, would have picked up in the past, but it's now my responsibility to know yeah. every note of these songs because there, there are these moments on tour where a fan could shout, play Night of the Hunter. Night of the Hunter's not on, the, on that particular set list. They're going to play it. I need to have something to to make the stage look good with, you know what I mean? And there is a t- there is a term called busking, which you it's a, it's the sort of lights you would see mid afternoon of a of a festival where it's just doing something. It's not necessarily appropriate, but you want to try and avoid that. But like if you if, if you if you're good at busking the desk and know your console inside out and you know the music, you can make something look good. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if that makes sense. Yeah. No. No. Of course. Um, so going from. I mean, you've you've jumped sort of from Rolo Tomasi to Thirty Seconds to Mars, which is yeah. Sorry about that. We're not, we're no, not no, going chronologically here. Are no, we? no, yeah, but that, <laughs> that, that's that's fine. I mean, obviously, we get there, and it makes people obviously understand that there's been quite a big transition from the type of artists that you've been working with. Having seen a fair few Rolo Tomasi and quite a lot of Devil Sold His Soul shows, uh, it would make a lot of sense to me that people would go, hmm, if you can make that band with that very difficult music look both kind of crazy and cinematic and beautiful at the same time, which yeah. is what essentially what their music is, then you must be able to do bigger things in bigger rooms. Were you sort of instantly keen to go, I want to try and test myself on a grander scale? 
I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't say I was because I loved the club shows. I, I loved the, the the academy shows, the smaller European venues, the smaller American venues, because you have control of the room a lot more than you do in a big stadium, but or a big arena or a big shed or something like that. But what I'm trying to do as my shows get bigger is try and keep that small room intimacy, because that's why every, even if you're in an eighty thousand capacity room, like festival crowd or big stadium show, you still want to be able to see the artist you paid your money for or feel the artist you've paid your money for. You know what I mean? So even as my shows get bigger, even from like a club to Brixton Academy or from Brixton Academy to the O2 Arena, I'm trying to keep that intimacy. And somehow mm. I've got, a few, I've, I've, I've started developing my own little tricks. Like and it, I didn't invent the, the B stage or anything like that. And that's something that happens in stadiums and, and, and arenas all the time. But I brought it into, and I'm sure, it, I'm sure it had been done before me as well, but I'd never seen it. Um, I brought it into like the Brixton Academies and the all the all the, the smaller rooms. So with Frank Carr and the Rattlesnakes, we between me and the sound guy, we stuck a second stage. And then yeah. halfway through the show, he appears there, and the guy. There's this awesome picture of a guy who's got in the middle of the back barrier, as it were, with his with his back to us. Turns around, he's in tears because Frank's a meter away from him, and it's just like you've made that person's life, hopefully, or the, or at least their year. You know what I mean? So mm. if you can, as the rooms get bigger, if you can keep that sense of intimacy. Uh, and you can use that. You can use video screens to make sure they can see every with, with a decent camera angle to make sure you, you can see every sort of movement or every sort of gesture, and you get that int- intimacy there. Um, but there, there are ways of doing that. But that's that's what I'm trying to do. Every as my shows get bigger, I want to try and like not emulate the smaller rooms, but at least get that feel and the vibe. And uh, yeah, that, that that's just my my mm. my goal, my personal goal. Yeah, well, Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes is a great example of someone who can. I think an artist who can make a very, very big room and a very, very big crowd feel like a oh yeah sweaty little punk show. Oh, he, can, he controls them like that as well. He he, yeah. he has a meeting out of the palm of his hand. He's a he's a mm. genius. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I so I, I worked with Frank at, uh, with his band before that, Pure Love as well. But and bearing in mind, I'd, I'd seen him at festivals with Gallows and thought Gallows were awesome. Got the chance to work with him during the Pure Love days, and luckily that went on to the first two records of the Frank R and, and the and the Route Snakes um, project and loved every second of it really and uh yeah yeah they're a, they're a, they're a, they're a cool beast beast of a band what was the pure love times like because obviously frank kind of turned his back on more aggressive the sort of the spiteful snarling aggressive punk rock of gallows there's obviously the famous line at the start of that first pure love album where he says i'm done with screaming what were those shows like and 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 how was it like how was it working with that band because it feels like i don't know they just people weren't ready for that then were they there was a there was a lot of negativity but mm. frank frank didn't care frank was doing his thing frank frank wanted to do that and he controlled controlled the crowd the uh the same way as he would for the for the rattlesnake shows or for i'm assuming for gallows as well so i was fortunate enough to the, i did pure love at the pit at reading and leeds and then the, the, like the third show of frank and the rattlesnakes was also the pit at reading and leeds and um it was the same vibe in the crowd even though the music's different it's still frank controlling the crowd you know what i mean at glastonbury we played before the killers so the crowd might not have been a route next crowd and someone threw a bottle of warm what frank called warm cider it was obviously <laughs> pissed at, right at him while he was standing on the crowd doing handstands and he went uh, i hope that was warm cider it looked the guy directly in the eyes and you could see you could see this guy go oh shit i've just been caught out you know what i mean like the, he knows exactly what's going on in this crowd and he's in control so mm. yeah the energy levels on that is, is 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 something else to and he'll be around for a long time he's not going anywhere <laughs> no, no i don't think so no not at this point i mean just yeah it, it it's great to see i mean i, I don't want to get too much into a sort of isn't frank carter great chap <laughs> with you for the moment because i'm sure there's a, a there's a build up to that but um so where did you go like what happened as a sort of big significant thing post working with bands like devil and rollo that kind of made that step up into those bigger rooms and those larger artists so i think it would have been well it's just it was just hard graft and working through and uh, so from them i went to bands uh similar bands i guess but edging towards the more mainstream things like a uh, Australian band called Carnival who uh, again band. still yeah mm. awesome band um, and again still very tappy very weird time signatures in places but leading into that more almost mainstream they're, they're definitely not but you know what you can see where I'm going from relative massive mm. with them um, and then I got the Anna Calvi gig and then I got the sword I guess the first sword 
and that was the that was a moment where a lot of people, a lot of managers started taking me a little bit more seriously and the offers just kept coming and I for about seven years I didn't say no to anything. <laughs> and it's it's only since COVID I've actually had some time to pause and um reflect, I guess, on how busy I've been over the last seven or eight years and maybe I might slowly stop saying no uh, stop saying yes to everything but I, I i don't think that's the case at all but um yeah it was it was that first sword that really made managers and people notice uh, and it's just it's just word of mouth i guess people don't really want to read a cv in our industry so if you impress someone if you if you um if someone comes to see your show if you're supporting someone or and you put on a good show or if if, you, if you're just a nice person on tour there's a lot of potentially negative things to get annoyed about but if you just if you just chill and you're a nice person to tour with and you're good at your job jobs will come in my in my experience anyway and uh, I don't think I've done anything different to any of my peers uh, that I respect and I, I I think I don't take myself too seriously I, I just I class what I do flashing lights at bands and sometimes they're in time you know what I mean but um yeah some people can get oh I'm a I'm a creative darling I'm an artist you know what I mean there's there's a lot of that going on sometimes I don't know if you take yourself too seriously, it's going to be detrimental, I guess. But um, I just enjoy what I do. Genuinely, I get to I get to do my hobby for a job, and I'm forever grateful for that. Genuinely, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so, so that Anna Calvi gig. I mean, obviously, when we talk about Led Zeppelin tribute bands, Relative Massey, Devil Sold His Soul, um, going to see Motorhead, Anna Calvi's a very different type of artist. I mean. To just begin with, how familiar were you with not just her as an artist, but that world of music? I mean, obviously that's much more Radio 6, Mercury yeah. Prize type stuff. Um, was that daunting at all or are you already familiar with that sort of thing? I, I, I Genuinely, I uh, I got the email about her from her tour manager and I YouTubed her and instantly loved her music. She's there's a lot of Hendrix vibes in there. My son's called Hendrix. So I'm obviously into the, into that bluesier rock side of it. And, uh, it was a different challenge. It's, 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 it's just using your skills in, in a different way, you know what I mean? And, and how to adapt and how to evolve. And, but no, it wasn't, it wasn't daunting or scary. I jumped at the chance and it was, a. Uh, and you're right. It was a completely different world from from the maybe let, let's call it the Kerrang world I was in to the yeah. to the Radio Six world it became. Mm. And uh, from there, I, I got with artist, uh, another artist called John Grant, who I worked work with to this day, and mm-hmm. um, I actually FaceTimed with last week. You know what I mean? So it would like the, the 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 thing about what we do. And I went into a university the other day to, to talk about lighting design with the with the kids, and they're like, "How does how does it?" the kids the students you know what i mean mm-hmm. um and they were just like how does it different uh, how how does it differentiate between tv lighting rock and roll lighting theater lighting and it's all the same discipline genuinely and, and that goes yeah. that goes across genres as well it's as long as you can light a subject appropriately you'll be fine you know what i mean and uh, i don't want to simplify what i do and i hope my clients aren't listening too hard to what i'm saying right now but <laughs> um it's it's the same discipline across genres and from a metal band like Cross Faith, who are chaos, to to a singer songwriter like Nick Mulvey, you're still lighting a human being, mm. and if you can do that, you'll be fine. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned Cross Faith because I was just having a little look at your uh, your CV, and I wanted to bring Cross Faith up because I yeah. think you you got them at a point where um, I mean, it feels like the excitement levels surrounding that band have dipped a little bit over the over the last few years. But there was a point where they felt it felt like they might be the next kind of big sort yeah. of crossover metalcore band. And yeah. I saw them a bunch of times from the underworld up to probably Coco, maybe Roundhouse, I think they did as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the shows, like you say, were chaos. What's it like meeting with an artist like that who, and trying to, I mean, it, that was a whole sensory overload, their yeah. shows how much fun and how much hard work was a, a, a gig like that it's incredible so that underworld show you mentioned i i, I lit that and the and the uh coco show uh, the, the so the thing with them is as we were doing underworld in london they were doing through four thousand capacity in japan mm. so they had this weird they had they had extreme financial backing um to help us do what we were doing over here whereas a band of that, their size over here just wouldn't be able to do it but they also had the but we've done that in Japan. Why can't we do that over here vibe? And I was fortunate enough that they took me over to Japan as well. So we were able to do, I had, had a bit of continuity between the two productions as well. So mm. I could do the bigger shows in, in Japan 
and then replicate them in Coco, for example, where we had the Kabuki and the video and all that sort of stuff. Um, like that 30 second video, uh, sorry, the 30 minute intro video. As soon as the sport band finished, we dropped the Kabuki and there was all mm-hmm. that hype. And then Tatsu would sound check his, because at this time in Europe, they were teching for themselves as well. Like they had right. no guitar techs or drum techs. So we dropped the Kabuki. And it's a weird place to be where your production's bigger than your your backline crew, I guess. But um, so Tatsu would line check his own drums, but we'd, we'd slowly light him from behind as well. So the crowd knew it was him. And there was this hype and this big, this big, um, well, yeah, just a lot of hype around them at the time. And the weirdest thing about that is the language barrier, I guess, because at the time, so a couple of the band members didn't really speak that much mm. English. Mm. Um, you should hear their English now. It's, it's phenomenal how how quickly they've all picked that up, and, and just again, it's just adapting and evolving, I guess. And yeah, um, but yeah, you're right. At one point, when I started working with them, it was like 2013, and Monolith had just come out. And I remember watching them going, "Oh, they're going to headline download one day." Yeah, of course, of course, I've got to get involved with this band. And yeah, it's, it's a bit of a shame that it slipped off a little bit, but there are reasons behind that. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things, I guess, that the rock and roll world is a bit of a a feisty beast sometimes is it hard lighting a band and giving a band who are obviously significant like you said significantly bigger in their home country and are used to doing these big shows and then them coming over and going we want it to be exactly the same but there's going to be a tenth of the amount of people there at what point do you have to go guys come on you can't do that have you ever had to have many of those conversations i should have i should have had those conversations with them but at the time i was kind of still trying to push myself as far as I could go as well. So I was calling in favors with hire companies and, um, and lighting manufacturers to try and, even though the budget wasn't there, I was trying to make it work. You know what I mean? And I wanted to create their vision. And obviously there is a limit when you're in the underworld of how many, how much you can put on stage. And even like with the programming side of it, I was being a bit cautious about how much strobe was in the show. Cause I didn't want, didn't want to hurt anyone. Genuinely didn't want to hurt anyone. And they would be like, we want more, we want more strobe, we want more strobe at this point, blah, 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 blah. And they're, they're very, um, they were very, they knew exactly what they wanted and exactly what they didn't want, which was great. But have, trying to explain to them, we're not in a massive room right now, we're in the underworld. This might hurt someone. We just got to tone it back a little bit. Like, we, we don't want to tone it back. You know what I mean? So it was, it, was, it was trying to find that nice balance between explaining what the technology could do in this sort yeah. of room and what we, how we should use it. I still enjoyed those shows. To, to, like, they were incredible fun. They were a very exciting band at the time. Um, yeah. That kind of reminds me of, it was a similar thing to when Ramstein first came over in the mid nineties to the UK. Yeah. I think they played a place called the first ever UK gig was a place called the Finsbury Park Powerhouse. Uh, and they, which is kind of like, a, a, not, I don't think it was even as big as the underworld. And Till brought out his flaming jacket and all that stuff. And they kind of refused to, toned down their production at all and they were they were shooting things at like the ceiling which is about a foot above them and stuff and people were like i remember reading reviews of it going and people going how is this not breaking every health and safety rule in the book and then when they came over a few years later they i think they actually ended up refusing to do a few venues because they wouldn't let them have the show how do you feel about that about a band who are that unwilling to compromise with their vision of their show i mean obviously it's their show but you know for you i yeah i fully respect that if you want to if, if you're if you're selling a product you believe in so much that you you a venue's going to make you do a half-assed version of it i, I wouldn't want to do it if i was the artist i mean they as far as i'm aware they're all now pyrotechnicians because their show's so mental and they've pioneered some yeah. safety some safety techniques that are now industry standard so to the best of my knowledge, the reason why they're quite static on stage is the six positions. And I might, I might have read this somewhere and I might have got it completely wrong, but as far as I'm aware, they're all on like a pressure pad sort of vibe. And if they're not there, the system isn't complete and the, the, the pyro won't go off. And again, to the best of my knowledge, I think acts like Cirque du Soleil and big theatre shows now use that sort of mm. system, Disney, that, uh, that was pioneered by a German industrial metal band you know what i mean so if if they're that driven to have their creative vision then yeah i can see why they wouldn't want to do it a half-assed version of it yeah so it's fair. i, I mean that. the only thing is is it i guess as a fan do you want to not see anything or see the most that you can see i mean 
yeah, seeing cross seeing crossfaith at the underworld was amazing but if they'd have gone well we don't get the you know the kabuki mask video we can't fit in here so <laughs> we're cancelling the show i would have been a bit like oh great like we'll wait yeah. until we come back and we're doing you know that's the, the sort of the the beauty of seeing those bands in small venues is you see a kind of early stripped down version of it and it's something you remember uh, more I yeah, guess, and, yeah 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 so i think it's a weird one although in ramstein's case i'm not sure you want to see ramstein unless you're getting the whole thing anyway well there so. is that I, I, I didn't want to say that maybe maybe it's 50 50 what what you actually go to see with ramstein i've seen them loads of times they're one of the only bands they're my nine inch nails that i'll actually pay to go and see nowadays but um mm. i met till once randomly uh mm-hmm. was, it was a hellfest 2016 maybe and i was i was there with bullet for valentine and we had this big rear riser that rolled off and rolled straight onto the truck and it was like a it was like the the a b main stages so it was bullet for valentine i think he hate breed mm-hmm. then ramstein so yeah and the till was till was just it was pissing it down with rain so all i saw was this very tall person leaning on my riser wearing a big black overcoat i slapped him on the back and went excuse me mate, i need to move this and uh in my very British accent, and uh, he turned around. He's in full stage garb with all his makeup on. And he he took me by surprise. I went, "Oh shit, sorry, Till." And he went, "No, no, no, I'm in your way," and moved off. And uh, it was like, "Oh, okay, cool." By then, <laughs> so that was my <laughs> one one meeting with Till just before he was about to go on stage. I, I pushed him off my riser essentially. <laughs> Great, yeah. Uh, he seems like he'd be quite a down to earth guy, so that's good to know. That oh, yeah. He is, yeah, he is, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was very um, cool about it. Speaking of kind of big, big name artists, I mean, you mentioned Bullet For My Valentine there. Uh, you did the Poison 10th Anniversary yeah. Tour with them, which obviously is their big album. Bullet, again, another band who had uh, big ambitions, which were never sort of fully realised. Um, There's a lot of chat about them, again, being potential festival headliners for a long time. That appears to have gone away now. How is it working with those guys? And again, you probably would be in a position where you could talk to that band and see the level of ambition they had was that a well yeah how how was that basically i mean it was it was great fun so we were doing we were doing two albums as it were at the same time mm. so they, they were doing the the venom album they had just released and then the the poison record so we had two shows touring at the same time and sometimes you do two nights like for example at brixton we did one night we did the venom the venom tour and we did the poison mm-hmm. tour the next day or vice versa um the show is is incredible like all of them on stage are incredible musicians um it's not it's not the full lineup anymore but um everyone on stage is an inc- incredible and they're fun to tour with it's easy they're pros and i mean for that for that tour i, I for the poison tour as well i had this idea of blowing the 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 overhead rig up and setting all the amps on fire i said that to matt he was like is it safe i was like yeah it's safe he went, all right let's 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 give it a go and like there was that freedom of the budget with that one where i was like mm. i've got this idea it's going to be cool it's going to be expensive do you like it should we try it and it was it was it was a really simple conversation of yeah let's do it <laughs> and uh I, I think we smashed it if i'm honest with you the, the overhead rig blew up extremely safely showered sparks down at the stage this was the opening of the encore and set all the amps on fire all all extremely safely and the first song of the the encore was essentially lit by firelight and it was um again it's a different way of using light as a medium to light an artist mm. um whilst being appropriate to the genre and and with the budget in mind even though the it was a relatively soft budget on that side and we we could make it work budget restrictions sorry but um yeah it was it was incredible fun i mean i i used to listen to the poison record when it first came out anyway so it was it was kind of a it was a, it was a, it was an honor to do you know i mean it was, it was the fact that they've asked me to do it was it was it was really good fun we did, we did some massive shows my first day on the job with them was rock and ring and it was the year where there was that massive thunderstorm yeah and i think we we got our stage time got pushed up back and back and back and back and i think we didn't go on stage till about midnight anyway so which was technically after the red hot chili peppers so did the red hot chili peppers support bullet i don't know but um <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was just a privilege to be involved with that one um yeah the only the only other time that's happened to me where where i thought this is actually I, I worked with again it's it's one of those sort of if you know the band you know the band but i worked with a band called hell is for heroes and uh when i was back at college learning how to do lights i was listening to the hell is for heroes first record and probably the bullet uh, 
uh, first record as well, The Poison. And yeah, I, I got an email one day to say um, from a tour manager friend of mine, would you would you like to come and like the 15th anniversary of the Hell is for Heroes Neon Handshake record? And uh, mm. I had to delete the email saying, yeah, I'll do it for free. Yeah, yeah, of course. It was, it was, it was a, that, that was a definite highlight for sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, they did that. Um, I think they did that with 100 Reasons. They had 100 Reasons doing Ideas Above the, Our Station and Hell is for Heroes. Did, uh, did they play the album in full when they supported No, this, this, this was a couple of years later. So there, there right. was that tour with Hell is for, with, with 100 Reasons, but this was this was their own headline tour. They had A on a on the road with them. Ah, uh, um, yes, I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. And, and Vex, like, Vex Red? Vex Red, Red yeah. I was okay. actually randomly chatting to Ant from, uh, from Vex Red this morning mm. <laughs> about something. Yeah, small world. Um, yes, so I mean, I was going to ask you going back to Bullet really quickly. Do you think they still harbour those sort of ambitions? Because obviously, like you say, they're not. It's not like they're a small band anymore. They're still a very big band. They can still set up Brixton Academy, um, but it does feel like the, like I say, I think the 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 are you going to headline downloads train has left the station at this point. But do you think they still kind of harbour those sort of ambitions? Because they are capable of putting on. Yeah, this huge show, which I think is what the fans of that genre are. That's what they want, isn't it? And I think yeah. Bullet are one of those bands who at least appear to be reaching for that. I, I hope they headline download one day. I think they deserve it. They've they've been they've been around for so long at the same level, consistently being incredible. It'd be a shame if they didn't headline download. But I, I do I do know what you mean. They certainly deserve it. And uh, let's see what happens. You never know. One day. We are running out of festival headliners at the moment. so <laughs> Massively running out of festival headliners. Yeah. So, um, well, let's talk about another one that could be then. So, I mean, you mentioned 30 Seconds to Mars. Working with 30 Seconds to Mars is working with a A-list Hollywood superstar as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jared Leto seems like a... Well, he is a brilliant actor. I'll, I'll yeah. give him that. Um, he seems like a... a <laughs> how do you even how do you even uh describe jared leto <laughs> I, I can i can what, tell how polite you're trying to be right now how do you how do you describe oh, well then i'll throw it to you how do you describe jared leto and what's it like working with him i mean i when i got the call to do 36 to mars that was it, it was it was i was never going to say no to it but it was it was the first time i've had this massive rush of anxiety of should i be doing this because Someone, like a couple of my friends had, had had my position in the past and told me a load of horror stories. Uh, someone had told me I was LD 53 in 18 years or something like that. And that's a horrific fact. If that's true, that's horrendous. But you know what? M- my personal experience working with him was it was fine. He's a, th- I think the thing that people forget about Jared is he, like you say, he's an actor, but he's also a director and he knows exactly, again, he's, he knows exactly what he wants and exactly what he doesn't want. And one day I got a random FaceTime call from a, from a LA number. And ironically, if, uh, if he had called five minutes before, I probably wouldn't have picked up because my son was having a massive tantrum, but I, I picked up and was like, Hey Tom, how are you doing? It's Jared. Can we talk about lights? That's how I got the job. So, okay, cool. All right. No, wow. no formal, no formal. Would you like to work for me? It was like, can we talk about lights? And on that, he told me exactly what he didn't like, exactly what he did like. And then we started talking about influences, not just like other artists, but, James Terrell and natural light installations and natural features like uh, sunrises and sunsets and rock formations and all this sort of random stuff that we could take influence from. And that was refreshing. It was different. It was a different challenge. It was a different way of seeing a different way of looking at a show. And Mm. the first show itself was an anxiety filled evening of, which is about a year ago now, where for whatever reason we didn't have any production rehearsals with the band before this seven week tour. So the first Fuck time Jared saw, but with, with the exception of a FaceTime call from my rehearsals, the first time Jared saw the show was as he walked on stage. And if he didn't like it, that would have been game over straight away. But we did the show, he left. We got an, an email saying, You guys are pros. Thanks for the hustle. That was it. And then towards the end of the tour, he said on stage, like we, there, was, there was a technical problem. He started stalling by pointing out the members of the crew and having a little bit of a dig about them. And he pointed at me and, and he said, this is Tom. Everyone turned around, look at Tom on lights. And he said, and regardless if this, tra- if this is true or not, he, these words left his mouth. This is Tom. He's the best lighting guy we've had to date. So that's kind of, that was kind of a nice, wow. going from the, the anxiety of should I take this to the validation of what he then said on, on stage. And I mean... I think he also appreciated all of the 
the, the, the directness and the honesty I gave him because I had a microphone directly to his ears. He had a mm. microphone directly to my ears. And I would be very precise. No, I would never lie to him. If there was a problem, there was a problem. This is the reason why. This is what we're going to resolve it. And I, I don't want to speculate, but I guess in the past he's had people who may have not liked the way he spoke to them and just went, well, fuck you then. This is what's happened, blah, blah, blah. Or there may have just not been a... There may have just been a com- complete communication breakdown straight away and then a personal vendetta sort of thing. But if, you, if you're just mm. honest and, you know, the video panel, the bottom video panel has been, uh, the bottom row of video panel has been cut because it wasn't up to standard. We've had to, we've had to reformat the video content, which is why it's looking a bit weird. It won't be this, it won't be like this tomorrow. It's just like, that's all I can do. I can only be honest with you. This is, these are the problems we've had. It's a festival. We're not the only people using this stage today. And he appreciated, I think he appreciated the honesty, you know I mean? We're all, we're all just trying to work to make his vision work. And I mean, I saw the diva side come out and luckily it was never aimed at me, but I just did what I did. And I, I just, yeah, I didn't bullshit him. I just said, this is, this is what's happening. This is why it's happened. So, mm. Cheers, Tom. Carried on with okay. you. You know what I mean? Good. So my personal experience with him was actually genuinely nothing but positive. I've been asked back to do the next album tour, which is rare. If, yeah. you, if you go by if you go by the eighteen uh, the fifty three LDs in eighteen years stat, so we're meant to be doing a show in August. This Mars Island show, it's still technically on sale. I it, it's not going to happen. I'm I'm pretty certain of that. But we'll see what happens with that. But <laughs> yeah, fair yeah. enough. I mean, I guess like say from a from a purely professional point of view, you wouldn't want to turn down a band who are playing such big venues who have as you said again with bullet with you know budget probably being pretty big and the ability to do something hugely spectacular i imagine jared leto is the sort of person who's going to want to have a super duper spectacular looking show yeah for you has got to be the sort of the main focus of whether or not you take a job 100 percent, and it goes back to my ambition my personal ambition i guess and yeah, you're right. There was no way I was ever going to turn it down because it's just wherever you go, you're headlining and that gives you a hell of a lot more freedom to be creative. You know I mean? Like if you're, if you're having to make budget cuts or it just, it just kills your vibe to be creative. You know what I mean? So it was, it was really good fun. I, I can't really say much more than that. For, for an LD who specializes in rock music and that's what, that's what they are, regardless if you like them or not, they are rock music. I loved every second of it, genuinely. Um, I, they, I wouldn't say they were a band that I had listened to beforehand, um, mm-hmm. but it was a pleasure. Genuinely, it was a pleasure to to, to be asked to do that and to survive it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, that is some sort of, that's a, certainly an accomplishment to get asked back, I have to say. Um, but anyway, let's let's move on to someone who I tell you I do yeah. quite respect uh, that you've worked with, um, is Zane Lowe. I really like Zane Lowe. I really, I know there's some people from the sort of alternative rock world who don't like Zane Lowe for whatever reason, but I think he's great personally. Um, I don't know if I'd go and see him in concert, but or DJing or whatever he was up to. But you worked with Zane Lowe. How's that? He seems like a fascinating dude. It was so cool, man. He, he, he was, um, and I'm ho- hopefully what I'm about to say won't be disproved by our chat here. But I, the weirdest thing I took away from Zane were working with Zane and spending some time with Zane was I learned the ability of how to have a proper conversation with someone because he, the way he is with people, he's obviously an interviewer. He, he, he's done some phenomenal stuff, but the way he cares about when he's talking to you, he cares about what your answer and he listens to every single word and picks out a little bit to it. You, you know what I mean? He's not just doing, that's yeah, not just yeah. like a stage persona when he's talking to Kanye West, when he's talking to his lighting guy, you could tell he's going, Oh, and, but is your wife okay with about this? And he would, he would just absolutely, pick every word apart and analyze it and say, oh, how can I empathize with this? <laughs> I can't say that word. Um, yeah. But so do you remember his Kanye West interview? I've only seen little clips. But, of, do you remember I, the I hype around few, it at the time? I, yeah, I definitely remember the hype around it. Yeah. Yeah. I so think- we were doing, we were doing a show that night, I think. Right. And I mean, like we were only, it would only be like the, 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 the fresh affairs and stuff like that. It's just yeah. a club night. But some, a, a nice level of production thrown into it and it's just good fun. And we got, we got to do some cool stuff with it. But he would do his Radio 1 show and then jump in a car with his driver, Justin, and come to the gig. But he would usually sleep or, or chill out for that bit. <clears throat> so he had turned his Twitter off. And he got out of the car and he was, he was like, hey, boys, how you doing? How's the day going? Blah, blah, blah. And he, 
it exploded. Uh, have you seen the? I think I actually said to him, "Have you have you seen the the feedback from your Kanye thing?" And he's like, "No, no, I'll, I'll go and check it out." And he went into a dressing room and, and like it exploded. And he was just like, "What the hell has just happened?" <laughs> it's just he, he couldn't quite comprehend it straight away. And yeah, that was kind of interesting to see how, even though it's gone out on air, he might not have got the feedback straight away and. Mm. that that little time delay does that make sense <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah 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 that's yeah. kind of that's kind of old school broadcasting yeah like, to a certain you know yeah, do yeah. you know what i mean it's you don't get if you nowadays yeah, that people, instant reaction yeah yeah people like live stream stuff and they go on instagram live and they're on twitch and they're on whatever and yeah. it's like here's or you know if you're putting stuff up on instagram and twitter you get instant responses and feedback as to yeah. you know with, is it good or not but i guess if you make a you know this is the the old school media of um, radio and TV and film and, yeah. you know, putting out albums where you have to wait a little bit before you know whether or not people actually enjoy the, the thing you're doing. I mean, that tour, the intro to the set was a Kanye West track as well. So he, he just walked onto stage and made some joke about, I don't know, just some, some joke about the whole situation. It, 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 he was still in shock about it as the show happened. He's like, well, I'm not going to, I can't change the intro now, can I? <laughs> so um, <laughs> that was, but that was, that was a weird one as well. Cause we're, we're going into venues that are stu- essentially student SUs mm. or the equivalent or like, like where their uni bands would play sort of thing. And then putting quite a lot of production into there. And sometimes they might not have the correct power and we've got to figure out how to do it properly or ad- again, adapt to, to make the show work. But I remember we we're in the Norwich UEA, which is a cool, cool venue. And it's on the main touring circuit um and the the intro starts and a pint just a full pint hits my lighting desk 30 seconds into the show i'm like oh, you, you actually kidding me and this was back in the days when you didn't have a backup or anything like this and mm. so i locked the console t-shirt off literally turned the console upside down shaking all this water out wiping oh. Oh, not water sorry beer and uh all liquid i turned to unlock the console and it did an hour and a half show i was like well this is this is incredible. How's how's this? How's this? It was an Avalites console, and it was just like this is that's just one of the reasons why I still use those desks today because it's it, it survived an hour and a half club show with half a pint of Carlsberg inside it. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it was it, it must have had a wonderful show. It was like oh, here we go, we're partying too today. <laughs> yeah, but, um, fucking hell. Yeah, I mean, built like that, a machine. That's happened. I think last time we had somebody who was in lighting on the podcast. I did bring up the, um, I think it was just after this had happened. I think Machine Head did Brixton At Academy. Brixton. Yeah, um, yeah. Last year, someone pulled it over the sound desk. It stopped everything. I also, a few months before that, saw Gajira. Gajira, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, someone threw a pint glass over or just chucked it from the back and it landed on their lighting rig. And they were like, well, we've got no lights for the rest of the show. I mean, it didn't really matter to them because they're fucking yeah. brilliant. But um, yeah, yeah. I, what kind of, does, does that throw you into an apocalyptic rage? Because that would drive me. Well, I mean, it's, I wouldn't come to their work and throw a pint at their on their work desk, would you? But um, no, I mean, I, the, what what can you do about that? You you just have to focus on fixing the equipment to the to the best you can and make the show happen. The the, the thing I was more worried about in the whole situation when I locked the desk, the stage was going mental. It was just strobes everywhere. It was the whole intro. It was it was, it was a very big stroby intro. It was like I've got maybe twenty seconds to get this working again before I kill someone. You know I mean? There, there was an extra added element of like the only, the only way that could have been worse was if the whole room was plunged into pitch, pitch dark, you know what I mean? And then there was that, uh, that second element of danger, you know what I mean? But mm. so I had that in my head, like I need to get this working as quickly as possible to get those strobes off just to put something, I don't care what it is, just put something else on the stage to make this room safer and a nicer environment for the crowd to be, even though one of them has ruined my day. So I didn't, I didn't really have time till the end of the show to get angry about it. And then I probably did get slightly pissed off about it, but what can you do? Eh? You're not, not going to go find that person. <laughs> is this, is this a cool sort of, you know, it's only because of that machine and Gajira shows being so close together with both similar sort of things happening at the same venue that I've even really thought much about it. Cause you do see receptacles yeah. flying around all over the place. Is this a, is this a common occurrence? That I've yeah, not really unfortunately, spent yeah. much of my life thinking about. Obviously it is. Yeah. Well, there's certain bands like Kasabian or the Cortinas, like these indie bands that they're, they're, Again, I don't want to completely generalise, but some some bands out there, I know I've just mentioned two, but some bands out there, their fans only want to go to the gig to have a little fight and yeah. I take a flare and hide a flare in their pants and take that in. But at, at a Kasabian show, for example, they have 
gazebos over front of house and they're, they're, they've lowered the legs down they've made like little bomb shelters for themselves because there's that much liquid flying around the uh around the room and like i know biffy claro now have or a lot of those sort of bands but biffy definitely have like protection over their pedal boards because pints are just flying all over the shop and mm-hmm. um but yes it's a it's a very common occurrence and it's, it's especially now like the the carly the not the carly academies the o2 academies now um uh sell two litre pints of beer you know what i mean so yeah I know. it's just more ammo for them you know it's ridiculous <laughs> so you, one to drink and then you just throw the second yeah. half away and then go and fill up yeah, yeah. fucking ridiculous i mean I, I i have a lot of respect for for the punters at these gigs because a they're paying my wages and they're they're allowing through paying the tickets they're allowing me to be creative with with my artist and every now and then i will stop and have a little look around and just like take note of where you are and just feel the energy of the crowd. I know that sounds really wanky, but there is, you know, there's an energy in a crowd, especially at these big sing-along moments. Like with Frank Carr, when the last song was I Hate You and everybody would sing it at the top of their lungs. You just have a little look around and you go, oh yeah, this is this is why I do what I do. You know I mean? Because there's, there's, the, ener- the energy of, of a crowd is cool. And there, there is a little, this is how I impressed my father-in-law. He came to a gig. I think it was actually, it may have been a Zane Lowe gig. And I just, I, I went, Dave, watch this. Pulled the pulled the house lights down by like five percent, and the crowd went way, thinking it was the start of the show. I was like, I did that. He was like, <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> just like yeah, but yeah, pint throwing is one of the things I hate from from crowds, and that can go away, please. That would be yeah. It's a waste of beer for a start, but it also ruins if it hits the sound desk or a, or a light desk in front of house or anything on stage. It's it it ruins it ruins our day because. Mm. But it's, it's 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 our problem to fix, not not the person throwing the pint. The other thing that pisses me off quite a lot about crowd and it's 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 usually the slightly older crowds. Um, I'm not going to name names, but like name name bands, but the, the older male crowd. If you're trying to get to front of house, they think you're trying to steal their place in the crowd, so they physically mm. block you coming through. I was like, no, if you don't let me come through, mate, you're not going to see anything tonight. So I'm not trying to ruin your night. Please let me through. Even yeah. if you've got a massive radio in your hand or a flashlight, they just won't let you come through. Just behave yourself. Just we're all here to have fun. That can that can go away as well. Yeah, that sounds like double dickhead behaviour. Then they exactly and then they prob then they probably throw a pint up in the air when the lights go it's, down. It's probably so the same person. I'm yeah. almost certain it would be the same person because yeah, there's a lot of those wankers around. Anyway, um, we don't before we don't want to turn this into like room run 101. So yeah, let's sorry, uh, <laughs> that's fine. So let, let's move it back onto um, a few other bands just before we kind of. Um, close up there's a couple of other bands i was going to ask you about one of them is the black queen who i think are great like yeah you probably some of you listening don't might not know the black queen is it's members of um dillinger Dillinger. it's greg from dillinger it's one of telefon tel aviv and somebody who's been a perfect circle as well and um and nine nails and nine nails yeah and um doing a sort of depeche modi meets aphex twin meets sort of 90s like swing music uh what a wicked band um and they played very small venues but had a very again like the whole mood they could change the whole mood of the venue as soon as they came on how was it working with them and greg's good isn't he greg's an absolute gentleman like that was the thing i can't even remember how i got involved with that band but i think i followed someone on instagram maybe followed the page i got i got a personal message back going would you like to have a chat about lights (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then yeah i'm pretty certain that's how that one started but again it, it goes back to like the Rolo Tomassis and the devil sold his souls and the hell is for heroes mm. i seem to have fallen into this niche of lighting these wicked artists that no one's ever heard about or if you have heard about them they're usually your favorite artist you know what i mean like mm. it's it's but the black queen yeah they again it's this 80s pop vibe with a yeah. rockier twist over top of it and, and greg from dillinger singing and like, uh, that's, it's, it's again it's like a little bit like pure love where you've got someone who's known for very aggressive vocals and it's their softer side their singing comes out and it's um it's a different beast mm. completely different beast and again the the budgets for lights weren't that big the the logistics to have lights on tour weren't there really we were it was a tour bus and a, and a trailer so you've got to be very precise and f- efficient with the lights you're taking on tour you can't take spares you can't take um, anything that's not necessary and that in itself is a challenge to make their creative vibes happen I didn't do them in, in America I did. I only did them in the in Europe but 
they had slightly bigger shows in America and they were, it's again, that crossfave thing where they wanted to yeah. replicate what they were doing over here and on a, on a shoestring budget. But we, we, we did it and we, we I did two albums with them. Well, I've done the two albums with them. I hope I do a third with them. And yeah, that was, that was good fun. Mm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed you brought that up. I, they're a, they're a very niche band. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's going to be a third album. To I don't be think honest. there is either. But no, I hope from, if there is, I would like to have a go. <laughs> from what I from from what I understand, I'm not sure we're going to get a third album, which is really upsetting. Because yeah, you're right. They're a brilliant band, and I don't really understand why. Because it's not really. It's not really like Renato Tomasi and Devil Soul to Soul is very niche music. Whereas mm-hmm. I think the Black Queen. That, that like, could have been been on radio when I first one. heard Ice to Never. I thought, hang on, this. Exactly. This is a Radio 1 afternoon play. You know what I mean? It's yeah. nice and easy to listen to. It's soulful. It's it's poppy. Let's let's not let's let's not yeah, be wrong. Really it's very poppy, but in a very good way. And around that sort of time all the all the big bands were had that eighties vibe anyway, like the nineteen seventy five were just coming out and so yeah, it was a bit surprising it didn't go further, but it was always just a hobby to them. It was their mm. passion project, as it were. That's that's why I call all these smaller sort of interesting artists. And um yeah. yeah, I hope they do something in the future and I hope I'm involved, but let's see what happens. Yeah. Me too, yeah. Really, really good band. If you haven't heard Fever Daydream, the first Black Queen album, you should go and listen to that. I think, I think Fever one. Daydream might actually be in my personal top five records. I surround myself with this music, mm. so you get to know it very well. And that's one of the ones that's come out and going, that's in my personal collection, you know what I mean? I really, really like that record. Oh, uh, yeah, um, me too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did you, did you see Spotify did this thing called Festify recently? Yes, you could turn bit, yeah. your 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 plays and your your favorite artists into a thing, and mm. th- this made me question a, f- a few things about my listening habits. But <laughs> like, they, my festival poster was Thirty Six to Mars headlining with with the Hunter main support and Young Blood. There, I was like, right, these are all my clients. I need to sort my life out. So in in lockdown, I have been listening to music that's on purpose. I've been listening to music that I don't work with, and just trying to have a bit of a because I'm going to be off tour now for the for a a year to 18 months total. I'm not beating, I'm not, I, there is an outside possibility there won't be any festivals next year. Is this a chance? And yeah. so I'm kind of mentally preparing myself for that and using this time to, like, I'm not doing, I haven't done any programming with lighting. I haven't done, I've done one design for a new artist, but that was because it had to go out. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been avoiding doing all my, all, all, the, all my programming and my CAD software on purpose, just to give my brain a little bit of a break from it. And, that that not listening to my clients is, I think, is something I'm also doing on purpose. Like I'm listening to, I'm listening to a lot of my old favorite bands that I used to used to really really enjoy, and I'm relearning to enjoy them again. You know what I mean? So yeah, um, that is something that happens when you work in music. You end up yes, sort of forgetting to listen to music for. For, for pleasure, for, for fun, yeah. Which is what um, it's meant to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I definitely feel I definitely feel feel you on that one. I mean, I, there's a couple of other artists I was going to ask you about, but since we started speaking about the COVID thing, I mean, what what are your kind of contingency plans? And I mean, obviously, is there any way you can work? Or is there any work you could do whilst this is going on? Or you, are yeah. you genuinely just like I got to wait? I mean, there are there are a few bits and bobs that we we, we are doing. I mean, like um, so I, I've my company's called Mirad, and we're, there's seven, six or seven of us. Um, so we're all still quite active with a lot of live streaming stuff. And that, that goes from setting up a physical gig in a warehouse with everything except the audience and then filming it to green screen stuff. Like we just done something with Louis Tomlinson from One Direction. That's the, the industry is adapting um, and still being creative with, with, as I said, with all the live streaming side of it. But me personally, I'm trying to, I am trying to avoid it. I've got a few clients. I've got a client going on a TV uh, Sunday morning brunch TV program <laughs> um, in a couple of weeks time. So we're going to set up a, a little show for that. But compared to what I would normally be doing, like my diary says I'm meant to be, and this is, I, I checked it this morning. I haven't deleted my calendar out of my phone. I think it's probably a mistake, but, but I'm supposed to be with Youngblood supporting Foo Fighters today or tomorrow. We're at least supposed to be traveling to the gig. And like, this is, ugh, what this summer's completely changed is, <laughs> but never mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of looking at like, oh, I was meant to be doing this and you're not doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean. So I, delete, I think I, in hindsight, I probably should just delete my calendar. And delete that it, calendar. But, yeah, I think that you'd probably feel better to just go, I don't have to have a reminder. Here's what you could have won. I'm being very positive about this whole COVID thing. And uh, obviously by saying positive, I, I don't mean positive about, like, positive with COVID, I mean positive outlook. Um, 
I've got two and a half year old. I was away for nine months last year. So this is some very nice time to be bonding with my son and my wife's a nurse. So I'm full-time dad pretty much at the moment. And I'm, I'm loving it. If I, if I'm, I'm, it's a completely different way to use my brain and like <laughs> to do smarts and crafts rather than, rather than a load in. But um, mm. yeah, it's, it's a nice, and I, I also think as it, as a industry as a whole, a year away from summer festivals, I think is probably good for everyone physically and mentally. And even just these, ven- these festival sites, they could use a fallow year. Glastonbury has a fallow year every now and then. So yeah. let's let the grass grow a little bit. I don't want to sound too hippie, but <laughs> I, I think, I think it's probably a positive thing to have a year away from festivals. Financially, it's a, it's, it's a stress for a lot of people, but yeah, I mean, what can you do? There, there is, there is, there's no way of changing the situation. So there's no point getting too yeah. stressed about it. Okay. It is what it is, man. You've got to deal with it. And yeah, I mean, I actually planned having a year off for festivals this year myself anyway. Nice. So I've got sort of lucky that I, yeah. I'm i not looking at people's Instagram with them going, oh, I just had the best time watching <laughs> whatever. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should have yeah, gone. I mean, yeah, so it's been, get... it's been lovely this year, actually. Well, okay. Well, look, last two artists I'm going to ask you about before we close up. First one's While She Sleeps. Um, yeah. While She Sleeps on the brainwash tour i believe you yes. work with them you've worked with them on any other tours uh, i did uh, brainwash the new are we so okay the, the cool. record so, after that um two yeah. very very strong records two very very strong uh, brainwash in particular is my personal favorite but you are we i can see they significantly up their profile oh, on that record um yeah. what's it like working with those guys it feels again like they're a band that got massive hype straight out of the gate and that hype seemed to kind of go away but then they've spent that time building it back up again just sleeps. by releasing really good records yeah sleeps aren't going anywhere they're they they are the most creative people all five of them are the most creative people i've ever met in my life all five of them are genuinely geniuses um not just with when it comes to the band they're they all do anything you can think creative they do and they do it well one of them is a graphic designer i think i think a few of them are graphic designers they've record all their own music as far as I'm aware or at least like, they're very active with that sort of stuff they've got their own little studio they've got their own little warehouse space where they've got a clo- their multiple clothing companies coming out of that and they do it all themselves and it's I, I, the one thing I took from working with Sleeps and it was well, so Matt Welsh the guitarist he is he is the most creative like creatively diy person i've ever met in my life to the point where so if you you know that brainwashed album cover is like it's red with the flag on it yeah yeah so at the start when i start, started working with them they had no budget really to do anything but they had these big ambitions to have a very cool stage show and one of my favorite bits of set i've ever made was me and matt made and it was um just a plain red backdrop and we got this is the first version of it anyway it did develop into other things but plain red backdrop with essentially a bed sheet on it where he spray painted the while she sleeps logo and we pinned it to it and then we put a fan underneath it so it was animated it was a very analog sort of way of like most people if you had more budget may have done that on a video screen it would have lost all this it would have lost all of its beauty you know what i mean it was just a bed sheet flapping in the wind and then when it got to the quiet number we turned the fan off and it went still and you had this and I didn't think people would notice it. And this is because I was, I, was, I was again very early on in my career, and I didn't think people would notice it. But the amount of fans that would come to front of house and going, "Were you responsible for the flag?" You know what I mean? It's just such a small letter. There was loads of other stuff going on 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 stage, but it's what it's, it's what made their viewing experience work for them. You know what I mean? And yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Was, and and that's one thing that I've I, I, I've take away from sleeps for the rest of my life is, is their diy attitude towards stuff you might not have the whole budget to do stuff and i guess that, like working with bands like the black queen and stuff like that take it through that's been taken through onto that but i'm rambling a little bit now right but um no no yeah. no not at all I, it I, was an incredibly rewarding experience working with them it was fun yeah it was no pressure the music's awesome the crew were incredible the crew were so their tour manager was the singer's brother. So Elliot Taylor, he, me and him worked on Frank Carr and the Rout Snakes together. And it was, it was nice, man. It was good fun. You, you make friendships that are going to last a lifetime and pick up skills that you're going to use on every other show. They just have such a strong, they have such a strong image and visual, like yeah. for a bunch, for, for five blokes who walk on in ripped jeans and a t-shirt, they've got such a strong visual 100%. aesthetic. 
um, while she sleeps. And they're one of the few bands from that kind of DIY hardcore punk like background who, uh, like you like you say, not only do they create it all themselves, they kind of think about it yeah. in far wider terms than 99% of those bands from that scene who are happy to just go, well, we're just normal dudes playing rock music and, mm-hmm. and that's it. And it's like, yeah, but you can you know you can bookend each album cycle with these you know when i think of brainwash the first thing i think of is the red red black. red and black red and black yeah, yeah. then you so, are yeah, has no. the smoke coming out of the hand and then yeah there's these very you're right bookmarked chapters mm. of that band and I, I i don't think that's an accident <laughs> that's what i'm gonna say but, but how i met that band they were supporting crossfave in, in japan yeah. and Five, I was in a bar on my own with 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 the crossover lads and all their Japanese friends, and they're all fluent in Jap- in Japanese and chatting away. And all of a sudden, five lads and their tour manager from from Yorkshire come in, and we got on like a house on fire. And then they had seen the crossover show, and I ended up ended up working with them for two albums, which is great, which is good fun. The first right. the first time I ever watched while she sleeps, I was side stage just just doing some bits and bobs ready for the crossover show in Japan, like one of them. And Matt lost his shoe, and it came flying off into the wing. And I, I became a shoe tech for the night, and I put it, I put it on, and ever, ever, <laughs> ever since then, we've, we've, I think, I think we bonded about that. But yeah, it was, um, yeah, put his converse back on, and he, whilst he was singing, he just like put his mm. foot up to one side. And it looked, it looked like it, it was meant to happen, I think. But <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, they're a great band, great band. Um, and finally, the last band I wanted to ask you about, a band who I've got, I'm going to confess, I don't know a lot about, but I understand there is a lot of hype about them at the moment. It's the young lads. Well, not, I was going to say sports team, actually. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Because their oh. album, as we record, comes out tomorrow. And I've read some think pieces from various music magazines who there are certain things that are saying they're the new Blur and yeah. they're the new most important sort of indie band in in Britain. And I've read some other things which are a lot of like, this is middle class, you know, kind of railing against their their middle class upbringing i've not listened to the album yet so i don't know i've listened to a few songs and i think it's fairly interesting but you have to see them live yeah you're there from the you're, kind of that, that yeah. feels like a quite a grassroots build that they've had yeah i mean so i think their record's already out and they were in a battle with lady gaga for number one and as far as i'm aware on the friday or thursday night they were in number one place and something happened on the friday and I'm not going to say the industry's crooked or anything like that, <laughs> but something happened on the Friday and Lady Gaga sold thousands and thousands of copies and, and, and took took the number one place. But yes, there is something going on there. It's very exciting. And actually, I, I didn't think you were, I thought you were going to say Youngblood, which is why I interrupted you. Apologies. But, um, no, that's fine. Oh, you're right. Actually, their album is out. Sorry, I didn't realise. Yeah, it, was out. It, 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 came out, it came out on Friday, uh, right, a week, week, week or so ago. But yeah, uh, they got a number two record, which for a debut record is incredible and you have to come and see them live they're wicked they're the, the, the yeah they're fun they don't take themselves too seriously mm. um alex the singer when we did the show at the forum had a britney spears head mic for one song just in an elvis jumpsuit why not i'm playing a massive gig in london it might be the last time i ever do a show this size let's let's do that and went for a little walk around the room um but the, like the level of production they already want and they've got the they've got the backing for it. There is something special going going on mm. about them. But like we opened the show with some massive uh, pyro hit, and the amount of uh, health and safety we had to go through with the forum, as you would expect, to make it work. The production, the the, the house stage manager from from the forum came down and went uh, as we were loading in. It's like I listened to the band. I wasn't expecting this much production for them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah, th- we're trying to do. We're trying not to take ourselves too seriously. Like the confetti hit was all these garish colours, like um, just just big primary colours. So it almost looks like a, a family disco sort of thing. And there was a balloon drop and all this sort of very tongue-in-cheek production that you wouldn't expect at, the, at that level. We almost, again, going back to the DIY vibe, we wanted to make it look like a, a DIY party where someone's just got a cannon, uh, a party gun, you know what I mean? Or a party popper sending mm. up into the air and very tongue-in-cheek, not taking themselves too seriously but very cool. And it's, it's indie, it's indie music. It's not, it's not, it's, it's the first non-metal band I think we've spoken about, but, um, um, no, that's not true. We spoke about Anna Calvin, John Grant, but, um, yeah. it's interesting. It's fun. And you should listen to the, uh, yeah, you should definitely come see a gig rather than listen to the record. 
It's okay, well, I, might, I, I might do both because I'm getting sort of from the looks of them and stuff quite sort of, like I say blur and pulp and that yeah. sort of thing it seems like a return to that they got um, a song about Ashton Kutcher <laughs> <laughs> right okay so I don't, I don't know what that says about them but that's, it's, um, that's good uh, he's not been in the news recently so I suppose no, no, that's no. quite good good for him <laughs> um, and uh, well let's yeah well, go on and, but let's, let's talk about Young Blood. I mean the reason I didn't bring him up I guess is because I don't really know much about him I know the kids like him yeah um, quite a lot don't they well they shut a street in Camden when we played the Camden Electric Ballroom right. and physically he, he said uh, they, and in fairness it's, it's not a stage persona like he wants to meet everyone who calls themselves a Youngblood fan and he will he will spend hours outside the gig meeting everyone and saying hello, taking selfies and that's the key to his success. Genuinely, he, he cares about the fans. He wants to make it a big, big movement. He, uh, he got us into a little bit of trouble at Brixton Academy because they said, you, they knowing that what he would have done is they said you can't meet the fans outside. So he said, all right, everyone, give me 20 minutes. Everyone stay in the venue. I'll come back out in a minute. So we're doing the loadout. He, he's gone and had a little wash and he's chatting to them all in, in the crowd. <laughs> it's like security freaking out. But he was just like, no, 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 just, just, give, just give me half an hour with them. And as we're loading out, he sat on the barrier in Brixton Academy with all the working lights on, chatting to 2,000 kids, the ones that wanted oh, to stay. But That's nice. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, and... Uh, it's the first time I've ever experienced, you know, you know, the, the phrase Beatles mania. Mm. I mean, like One Direction had it, but it's the first time I've seen it personally around one of the gigs I'm working at. And it's just the kids are there three days before the show in Paris, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and, and we've got a day off in Paris. So the tour bus turns up. They didn't know that freak out, lose, lose their mind that he's anywhere near them. You know what I mean? And um, it's interesting how that one's going. That's the, mm. it's, it's, it's interesting for sure I think he's Dave Grohl's daughter's favourite band so that's going to open some doors um, mm. so yeah he's um, he's a genuinely nice guy who's going to go very very far I think well it's a, it's a pretty interesting spread of artists that you've done over the years Tom it's a pretty interesting story but as I end the podcast yeah. as I always like to do with one question well a, a double barreled question <laughs> the worst ever day on the job and the best ever day on the job that you have had. I mean, let's start with the let's start with the best, I guess. Um, <laughs> Everyone always starts with the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did a did a, this massive show with Crossway in Japan. Um, this is one that comes to mind anyway. The the band's manager said, so the head of Sony Japan is going to be at front of house tonight. Is that is that okay with you? I was like, yeah, of course it's all right. It's, um, he's he's more than welcome. So it was it was on that Coco tour actually. So we had that intro we had that intro video and like well, it's not here yet. So but I haven't got time to worry about that. Whatever. Um, a second song into the show, this older Japanese gentleman in a very expensive suit, very expensive overcoat comes into front of house. I was like, well, that's him. So it's a shame I haven't got time to introduce myself now, but whatever, I, I can't. Um, and the funniest thing is he had come through the cross faith crowd to get to front of house. Like you like, so fair play to him for that. But and then he left he left again like before the encore. So I was like, oh, maybe it wasn't for him, whatever. Fine. It's a shame I didn't get to meet him. Shame I didn't get to introduce myself, but never mind. And then during the loadout, I got a, a, it was either a radio call or a text message to say, can you just pop up to the production office a sec? Um, Kazu, who was the head of Sony Music Japan, would, would like to say hello to you and have a chat to you. And uh, it turns out the reason he left the gig early was to go to a cash point to, to his own personal bank account to pull out a bonus for me. And he was up wow. there. Yeah, this never happened to me bef- since, or it hadn't happened to me before. But a little little envelope was passed over to me, and someone whispered in my ear, "Don't open it yet. Wait till he leaves the room." Japanese etiquette, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a very nice little bonus from him. He said it was one of the best lighting gigs he's ever seen, and it really added to the night. And he was extremely impressed, and I should be proud of myself. To and all words to those effect in very broken English. So that was kind of that was kind of cool. So that's the best day. Um, I'm sure there's been a couple of stinking days for you, Tom, uh, over the years. What's the very, very epitome of the worst one? I mean, uh, there's there's one that I definitely shouldn't say, and I'll tell you afterwards, uh, where I wanted the ground to swallow me whole and and I wanted to disappear. But I still work for that artist, so I probably shouldn't tell you on, on air. So I, I will tell you afterwards, I promise. But um, right, Fair enough. There is one that definitely jumps out uh, and is actually... As it happens, it's two years to the very day this happened. We were traveling between Hurricane and Southside festivals in Germany with Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes. Um, so it was Southside to Hurricane. We had already played Southside. It's like Reading and Leeds, but the German version sort of thing. And at 5.30 in the morning, our bus driver fell asleep. 
whilst we were moving oh. and the bus crashed um and I'm, that sounds very blasé now but at the time as you can tell it was um pretty horrific if i'm brutally honest with you um i woke up laughing in the fetal position in in my bottom of my bunk just thinking oh we've actually crashed um and then we heard our tall manager elliot going boys boys and girls get up it's time to uh it's time to get off the bus we've had a little ding um but the little ding was um the whole side of the bus was written off the trailer was written off luckily none of our none of our gear was damaged or any of the lighting that we had in the trailer but um, and in, to, in, in true Frank Carr and the Rattlesnakes star, we did that show that day. Um, but yeah, the bus the bus was written off. So at five thirty in the morning, we're sat on the side of a German autobahn and drinking cups of tea and not really sure what's happened. And in hindsight, it could have been a hell of a lot worse because I think probably let's say twenty seconds down the road there was a big concrete bridge. Those big German concrete bridges you get where the feet of them are in the hard shoulder sort of thing. So if we had carried on a little bit further, who knows what would have happened. But that was probably, it's probably up there with one of the strangest days, if not the worst days on, on, on the road. But we we did manage to, I mean, the sense of camaraderie that came out of it and the fact we all survived it and that it was a miracle that no one was hurt. I think our sound guy, Mike, was thrown out of his bunk, but again, he woke up laughing. So it was all very blasé at the time. But in hindsight, pretty, pretty dangerous, really. And yeah. Well, I mean, you know, unfortunately, the 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 music world is littered with incidents like this that, that aren't a kind of end to a, a podcast that you just go, oh, that was a pretty bad day. You know, it's littered with Cliff Burton and yes. Viola Beach and the ghost inside you know, mm-hmm. drummer having have his leg amputated and, yep. you know, all of Baroness bar John Baisley leaving the band because mm-hmm. they just can't tour after a bus crash. So that is, you know, it's genuinely there, dangerous, very scary thing to happen. And I mean, I'm not going to name the bus company because that will get me into all world of problems. They know how pissed off I am with them because the, the series of events that led up to this, and we won't go into it too much, but the series of events... They were at fault. They were trying to cut corners with the budget, in my in my opinion, I should say. Mm. Um, the driver was overworked. But actually, like for me as well, the, the other side of it is it's not the first time I've been on one of those buses that's crashed. In 2013, I was... And it was a much smaller scale one, but it was a very similar sort of um, situation where the driver um, the driver was overworked. Um, and it was it was a single-decker bus. And my bunk, my bunk was right above the emergency exit so the stairs going down to the emergency exit and we hit something i don't know what it was like a concrete pillar or something but the door was ripped up and from my bunk i could see white lines in the road on the motorway so uh, i mean there are questions to be had and recently the same bus company had a very very serious crash with a band called pale waves i don't know if you're aware of that i do know that band yeah. I, I, I know that band and, and their crew quite well and it was tr- extremely traumatizing. Like there was glass in their bunks and all of this. So th- that bus was written off. So I, f- I feel like some maybe something positive that will come out of COVID will be people thinking a little bit more about hours between gigs mm. maybe and keeping it a little bit safer on the road and at least starting conversations about this. But uh, let's face it, everyone's going to try and keep squeezing as many gigs in as they can onto that tour. <laughs> Yeah, and probably trying to squeeze all of the money that they have lost um, in this absolutely. interim. Into, absolutely. I, I would imagine, I mean, as you said that, I was thinking, I would imagine more corners are going to get cut than ever before. I mean, I don't know, but... I, I Unfortunately, I do agree with you on that, but let's... Uh, the positive side of me goes, maybe this might be the, the kick up the ass that the industry needs but on on the positive side of that of that day when we got to hurricane everybody was aware of what had happened uh, and when our bus finally limped in so we so we we didn't make it to the festival on our original bus we got picked up on the side of the road luckily another band doing the same journey um and I, I won't mention the name of the band because their bus driver got into a bit of trouble for picking us up but i i think that their bus driver was a hero mm-hmm. but the first thing their bus driver said to our bus driver was where's your double driver because this is a nine hour journey and you're not really meant to be doing it on your own. So there's, there's mm. the problem there in my opinion. But um, yeah, luckily this, this uh, uh, bus from another company 
pulled over on the side of the road they just so happened to have an empty trailer or like one flight case in the back of their trailer for whatever reason so they could put all of our stuff in there and, and heroically took us to the festival um and then on the other side of it, the Prodigy, so Leroy, the Prodigy's truck driver, took our lights back for us because they were coming out the same warehouse. They didn't have to do that, but they were extremely kind. I think Biffy Claro took some of the band back. We went to a hotel and I think we flew back the next day. But the, the, the most annoying thing about it, the, the rest of that week was cancelled and we were meant to be supporting Queens of the Stone Age for a few days. And oh, God. <laughs> we were all looking forward to those shows. Yeah. It's a pretty rough story, to be honest, Matt, and I'm glad that it's, it worked um, out better. I, on the, to, to kind of lighten the mood somewhat, you are the first person who's thrown a bus company under a bus on this podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> so well, well, I mean, I, I do like that, and I'll, I'll, I'll be expecting a trophy in the mail. <laughs> Dude, it's been lovely chatting to you. Hopefully you get Likewise. back to, um, you know, do some work soon. And obviously, hopefully you um, are, you make, sounds like you are, make the most of this time yes, with your family definitely. and your daughter and... Um, and the cat I've heard the cat meowing at the door trying to get him so (laughs) I'm going to let you go so you can go and give your cat some attention cheers buddy well thank you very much for having me this has been fun All right, there you go what a lovely man that was Tom uh, having a chat with me sounds like a very exciting and interesting career and again I just really like talking to people who are clearly incredibly passionate and excited and in love with the career they've chosen to take anyone who's into music in that way and in that manner and as deeply as Tom clearly is is all right by me so thank you very much Tom thanks for coming on we really really appreciate it thanks to you for listening we appreciate that we'll be back next week with another guest if you want to follow us on Twitter on Instagram or if you want to find us on Facebook we're on Facebook we're on Instagram we're at road crew pod on Twitter as well so there you go you can give us some love you can go and give us a sneaky maybe a sneaky review on the old iTunes page, if you don't mind. And as I said at the start as well, big shout out to our friends at Signature Brew. Cheers for being, you know, so supportive of the podcast. Very, very nice of you. Tom actually mentioned Sports Team, who are a band that just missed out on number one. I think Lady Gaga kept them off number one by a couple of hundred copies. And um, they've just had a kind of collaboration with Signature Brew. So that feels like a little bit of excellent serendipity between those two things so uh yeah go over to signaturebrew.co.uk and you can see a little bit more of that thank you very much we'll be back next week we've got a really really great guest coming up we've actually got a couple of great guests coming up before we end season two so do make sure you're subscribed and everything and we will see you very very soon